everyone. Um, this is the video that goes with uh, chapter eight, uh, the chapter on socio-emotional development in children. Um, and in this chapter, there's just a couple of things I'd like to highlight as usual. Um, one is, um, this is Erickson's stage of initiative versus guilt. Um, and Erickson, from Erickson's perspective, there was a psychosocial crisis that you were supposed to resolve at every stage of your life. And if you didn't, you could move on, but you, know, you might not be the best person you can be. So when you think about yourself or you think about adults, that you know, like do you know anybody who doesn't like to take risks, who isn't quite sure of themselves and doesn't want to put themselves out there, they might not be the first person to volunteer for something if they're not sure what they're getting into. Um, Erickson would say some of that goes back to early experiences with children where um, they perhaps didn't take an initiative or weren't allowed to or, or didn't, you know, for any number of reasons didn't do that. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't ever learn those things, but that, um, but that childhood is a really good time to do it. Um, but the children are wildly optimistic about what they can do. If you ask them, like, can you run a mile? Yes, I can run a mile. Um, can you run a mile faster than the person next to you? Of course I can do that. Um, children are just naturally um, overestimating what they can do, and that's really adaptive. Like, you don't want a child who's three or four years old going, eh, yeah, not so much with math. Don't think I'm going to be a math person. Um, I don't, I just don't see those little manipulatives working out for me. Um, that's not, you know, what you want is for children to be excited about things and to try lots of things so that they can see what they're good at or see what they enjoy because they tend to be good at things that they enjoy, um, just like us. Um, so that's Erickson's stage. Um, in this chapter, um, they talk a lot or, or the author talks a lot about children's um, emotional development. Um, and I want to bring your attention to, there are, there are a number of references in the chapter to Nancy Eisenberg and Rick Faves, uh, or in particular Rick Faves, but I think also Eisenberg, um, uh, talking about uh, how emotion is socialized. Um, and children learn from you. Um, there's a measure that I use in my student class that it's a little complicated to use in an online class called um, the Coping with Children's Negative Emotion Scales, where as parents, you know, what are, what's your style, what's your overarching style for responding to a child when something happens, what do you do and what do they learn from that? Um, and the general styles end up being, these are not parenting styles, these are um, styles of dealing with children's negative emotions. Um, as you go around your daily life and you notice people with children who may be having trouble with emotion regulation at that moment, um, having a meltdown, um, having a tantrum, uh, being upset about something, um, look at what the parent does and what the child might be learning for that. Sometimes parents, are trying to tamp down the emotions and or punish a child for having emotions. Like, you know, if you don't stop crying, I'll give you something to cry about. That kind of a, an approach. Um, the child doesn't learn a lot from that. So um, I would, I would uh, caution you not to judge everybody's parenting style based on a one second interaction that you have with them. Um, but parents do have different approaches, um, problem solving approaches, emotion focused approaches. You know, sometimes it's something that you can't do anything about. Something's been broken and can't be fixed. Um, and you try to make the child feel better. Um, sometimes it's something that you can do something about. It's something's broken and it can be fixed, and you try and teach the child that, um, that the best way to deal with their negative emotion in that sense is to address the problem in some way. Um, and we do that as adults as well. You know, if you have a um, you know, chemistry test that you don't do well on, um, you don't have a complete meltdown about that. You, you know, if it's the end of the semester, you might go out for ice cream, and it's like, well, I did the best I could, and, and here's what happened. Um, if it's something mid-semester, you say, okay, I'm going to uh, switch out my study strategy so that I do better the next time, and that's a problem-focused approach. So that's actually teaching the child to work through their negative emotions. When we think about emotions, we don't think about coping with positive emotions. It's like, why am I so happy? Um, that's not really something that we spend a lot of time worrying about, but we are concerned with negative emotions and um, how to teach children how to regulate their own emotions. Um, there are a couple of videos this week that I didn't post um, with the original assignments, um, but that I want to add, um, and if you're watching this next semester, they're probably already there. Um, of, I've got a couple of, exa of examples. One is a three-year-old who thinks she's in love with Justin Bieber, um, and so it shows her in various phases of a meltdown. Um, and the other one is a Jimmy Kimmel clip, and you may have seen these. This is one of the early ones uh, where he asked parents to videotape their their kids after telling them that they had eaten all their Halloween candy. Um, and so in both cases, you see how hard it is sometimes for children to regulate their emotions. And children sort of will try and bring it back around, um, and then they fall apart again. So at this age, they're just learning that, um, and that's, that's important for them. Okay, in the section after um, uh, emotional development, um, the, uh, we go into a discussion of Piaget's view of morality in children. 
Um, and the way Piaget thought about it is a little bit different than what you might have seen in introductory psychology. Um, in your intro course, you may have seen Colbert's theory of pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional moral reasoning. Um, in the, and we'll get to that. But in this chapter, it's uh, heteronymous and autonomous morality. Heteronymous morality is that idea that there's just justice. There's a rule, and if the rule's been broken, then there's a consequence for that. Um, very young children look at it that way. Things are very black and white. Um, as children get older, say um, 10 and up, um, it's more of a, an autonomous view of, of morality. And that's the idea that um, the consequence depends not just on what happened, but what the intent of the actor was. Um, so one of the examples in the book is um, if a child throws a plate and breaks it and breaks one plate, um, or a child is trying to set the table and drops a stack of a dozen plates, which one is worse? And for the very young child, they'll just say, child two broke 12 plates, that's worse. Um, and for the older child, what they'll say is, um, this child threw a plate, that's, that's terrible. This child was trying to help and accidentally dropped some plates, that's not terrible. And so the one plate in that case was worse than the 12 plates. So um, keep that in mind. You know, we, we do many of those same things as adults. We, um, sometimes we, we're very rule bound um, and we believe that um, a punishment should fit a crime in a, in a very um, uh, concrete way. And then other times we take into, and our justice system takes into account mitigating circumstances. What did the person know? What were the other things that were going on? Um, was their intent? Had they thought about it in advance? Um, so when you think about those kinds of moral decisions, it's not just children, it's adults as well. Um, uh, when you get to the gender section, there's a lot of terminology about gender. Um, we tend to talk, at least in, in this book, um, of gender as a binary issue, and we know in today's world um, that's not how we're dealing with it, but the research hasn't caught up. Um, and so most of the research on children's um, gender constancy, gender typing, gender schemas um, is based on sort of a male-female kind of a dichotomy. Um, and so that's how we're gonna, you know, it helps us to at least know that um, and then to know more things um, beyond that as the research catches up, but it hasn't yet. Um, so we're not, gonna, we're not gonna push the boundary there. And then lastly, um, with parenting styles, um, Diana Baumrin um, defined the parenting styles of authoritative, authoritarian, and um, permissive or indulgent. Um, and then there was this, a, another one that's called neglectful. Um, and when you're thinking about those, um, you know, I, I think it should be clear from the book that the author authoritarian style um, is the optimal one, right? Like no parent is perfect. Um, no parent is always going to respond in the same way. But if you have a general style of explaining to a child when it's appropriate, why you've made a decision that you've made, in addition to making the decision. So it can be firm, but also provide some explanation rather than a, an authoritarian style, which is very much, um, here's the rule, don't question it. Um, and if you break the rule, you'll be punished. Um, so um, those two things. And then the more permissive style is one that is attentive, the indulgent style um, is more attentive, um, but doesn't have rules. Um, and you probably have known children or, or college students even who have grown up under these different kinds of parenting styles, you know, when you think about somebody who grew up in a really authoritarian home where it was, there were lots and lots of rules and it was very strict, when they go off to college, the experience they have may be one of going a little bit, cra not crazy, but um, going wild just a little bit, um, pushing the boundaries, um, staying out late, you know, taking lots of risks. And one of the implications of that parenting style is it has not given the child an opportunity over the course of their childhood to learn how to set boundaries, um, and to, in particular, how to learn how to set boundaries for themselves. Um, the authoritarian parent does involve the child in the decision making um, increasingly as the child is older, um, and so that child learns more and has more practice in setting their own boundaries and their own goals. They might still experiment with things, but um, perhaps not to the same extent. The permissive, the child of the permissive parent also doesn't have, they haven't had a lot of rules, and so they haven't had experience in, in setting those rules. And so they too um, can have difficulty when they get to college, living independently for the first time and trying to decide uh, where the boundaries are and, and where, you know, what kinds of rules and, and guidelines they should set for themselves. Um, as you're reading that, like the, the, the end of that chapter talks about um, how the parenting styles can be over applied, right? Like authoritarian sounds great, but it's not great in every circumstance for every family. So there are cultural issues um, that, you know, so it may differ um, in different countries or even within, the, within a country, within different um, subcultures. 
Um, the other thing to remember is circumstances can change. Um, and you know, as a, just as a thought experiment, um, if you uh, were sitting down to the dining room table and your child spilled the milk, um, spilled a carton of milk all over the floor, um, what would you do? Like, how would you feel about that? And what, w what do you think your likely response would be? Um, or if your child, w you're getting your child ready for some formal function and they were wearing a really nice outfit and while you were getting ready, they went outside and played and fell down and uh, got their clothes dirty or got their clothes torn or in some way made it so that it wasn't appropriate any longer to wear that outfit um, to the function. Again, you know, what would you do? How would you feel about it? And then what would you do? Um, you know, another example might be um, uh, if you went to a store um, and your child knocked things down and broke things um, and you were going to have to pay for them. You know, you know what, what would your thought process be and then what would you do? Um, how would you approach your child with that? Um, so if you've thought about those three things, you know, the spilled milk, the dirty or torn clothes, the broken things, um, you think you know how you would respond. Um, Imagine though that you're on a, um, a fixed income, you're living below poverty, um, and you don't have any money left for the month. You know, you've, you've, you've exhausted all of your resources and you're just trying to get through to the next paycheck, um, and you don't have the money to buy any more milk. Or that was the only outfit that your child had that was appropriate for this function, and you can't, you, you, it's not just that you don't have the time, you don't have the money to buy them another outfit to wear to this function. Or, if they broke something in the store and you just flat out can't afford to replace it, um, you know, that may change how you will deal with your child. So you may be more strict with your child in those kinds of circumstances because of what's going on in your life as an adult. So, um, so I think, you know, we have to take a, a half step back when we look at parenting styles. There are optimal parenting styles, but there are also optimal, uh, you know, lives to be lived and we're not all living them. So uh, I think we have to, um, at least keep that in mind when we're talking about parenting styles and, and you know the advice that we give to parents. Um, so that's it for this week. Uh, use the Q&A form um, if you need to. Um, and again, I'll post a couple of uh, extra videos. Um, two of them have to do with emotion regulation, and then one has to do with um, interviewing children about gender. Um, and again, in a very gender binary, um, dichotomous kind of a way, but um, asking children about male and female roles um, so if you're not around children and you can't ask them yourselves, you'll be able to see some responses. So have a good week. Um, and as always, let me know if I can help you. Thanks. Bye.